um, this ad. And if you look through the comment section of it, people were absolutely outraged by that. And Pepsi pulled the ad after one day. For this interview, I would very much like to welcome a guest who probably needs no introduction, but for all of our viewers who are not as well acquainted with media psychology, I will briefly introduce her anyways. Our guest is a distinguished professor at the Belisario College of Communication at Penn State University. She's also the co-director of the Media Effects Research Laboratory, also at Penn State. Her Areas of research are media effects, media psychology, and entertainment psychology, media and emotion, and last but certainly not least, media, race, and gender, something we will be talking about later. And she's also the current president of the ICA, the International Communication Association. Welcome, Ms. Marybeth Oliver. Thank you so much for inviting me. Let's dive right in. So within your research on media and entertainment psychology, one of the main topics is eudaimonic entertainment, right? Eudaimonic entertainment is also the topic we want to talk about in today's interview. So first of all, what was the reason for you to focus on eudaimonic entertainment or meaningful media? Honestly, I started thinking about this issue when I was in grad school. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's I took a Yeah, well, I took a theory construction class and we had to take a theory and critique it. And um, the theory that I was critiquing was mood management and which assumes that we have hidden, we have hedonistic motivations for our media choices. And, but that just seems so wrong um, because, uh, you know, what about sad films? What about tragedy? And a lot of times those are those are films that people value the most, you know? So I wrote this thing. And then later on in, in my career, when I finished up, I, I was interested in sad films, but I, I, I um, would, I would have people write about, or I would measure their reactions and I would include some other e emotion items. And over and over and over again, when I would factor analyze that there would be this, same factor and it would be thing and it wasn't sad or melancholy it was like touched moved you know i felt you know heart, it was heartwarming and that and it just the data kind of were bossing me around and saying hey this is real you know and so i kind of left the idea of sad films and decided to focus on meaningful films because calling it meaningful because um I think meaningful films often have a sad aspect to it, but it can also have a very uplifting aspect. And I, I think meaningfulness is really what that's about. Okay, so when we talk about meaningfulness, um, do you have an example for us? So maybe what movie or series was the most meaningful or moving or contemplative for you to watch? Um, Uh, there's so many and <laughs> I'm going to pick one that, um, well, I'll give you two. And I, I'm picking these because it's, it, it, these are not, it's not like a, it's like it's Schindler's List or a Hotel Rwanda, which are like seriously heavy. When I pick these because they're not really heavy, but they, I found them meaningful. So one of them was um, a movie actually based on a Stephen King little short story called stand by me and it's about these three four friends it's a coming of age film and they go and they're going to try to find the body of this kid who had been murdered but it's really about adolescent friendships and loss and um defining moments in life i'm never going to get out of this town am i gory You can do anything you want, man. Um, and so it ha it's, I found it really very, very touching. Um, same with Goodwill Hunting, uh, you know. It's not your fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. That was, 
Ah, uh, I, I found it really, look, see what I'm doing. A lot of times when people have that, that they'll go like this, oh, no. That already leads us to, to the, uh, yeah, to the current research you are doing. Um, you are now calling it inspiring media in a very recent research article you and some of your colleagues you thin synthesized the research on eudaimonic entertainment into this model of inspiring media and as a quick uh, preliminary clarification for the viewers this model is not intended to be a definitive and irrefutable model right that needs no further work on but as an invitation for other researchers to follow you and your and your colleagues path on researching inspiring media and also its beneficial outcomes so what we want to do now is uh, to take us through the model step by step and have it explained to our audience by you as the leading expert in the field. Um, but first things first, we want to clarify some concepts. We have talked about meaningful media and eudaimonic entertainment and now also inspiring media. So how come that you use the phrase inspiring media for the model? Would you consider it the most fitting concept compared, for example, to meaningful media? Meaningful could have, could have certainly been, been part of that. Um, and uh, we didn't call it eudaimonic because eudaimonic gratification often focuses on the self. Mm -hmm. The self is, is flourishing. Um, and to be honest with you, a lot of research that studies meaningful media uh, there, it's really studying self-transcendent affect. Um, and so, but we didn't want to exclude eudaimonic <laughs> either. Um, inspiring, that word, I, I, and I'm going to be upfront with you, the, the research in this area is really messy. Okay, so. Okay. What does that um, mean? It means that people are grappling with concepts that are often overlapping, mm -hmm. that um, that are that are conceptually um, non-distinct. Um, that you know we we don't have a definitive measure, in my opinion, um, of of that. But um, ultimately, we, we we use the word inspiring because. In, Inspiration has a motivational component to it as well. You know, I, I'm inspired to volunteer, you know, uh, for a charity or something like that. And a lot of the ultimate outcomes are really motivational in nature. But you have to be careful with the word inspiring because people use it in a lot of different ways. So at one point I, I did a questionnaire where I just asked people to, to, to tell me, go out and get a YouTube video that they found particularly inspiring. And I got some that I would consider like meaningful, but then you had other ones like, I, this recipe is inspiring me to make this salad or something like that. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so, so the, the people didn't get what kind of inspiration you were referring to. Right. Correct. So I think you need to clarify it like something that you found inspiring, moving, touching, yeah. and then that people will know, yeah, what you yeah. mean. <laughs> and, and another thing that stands out is this emotion of self-transcendence, right? Or more, more perfectly, this uh, experience of self-transcendence. And you state that it really plays an important role within the model of inspiring media. So what exactly characterizes this experience of self-transcendence? There, there are a lot of, um, at, there, that, there's an excellent paper, <laughs> by the way, if, if you're interested in it, um, on the talking about the different types of tra self-transcendent experiences. Um, one of the ones that we, uh, that I personally have focused on a lot is, is uh, called, is elevation. And it's often elicited by seeing other people display exemplary moral virtue. Mm -hmm. And, but at its heart, self-transcendence is a, a, a turn away from egoistic concerns toward a recognition of others, mm -hmm. <laughs> the small self in comparison to others 
a recognition of the interconnectedness of not just humans, but interconnectedness with us, with our, our planet, with our environment. Um, so it's transcending egoistic concerns. Okay. Now I've focused on elevation, but it, as another example, awe might be another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's something we would also like to talk about. There is a distinctive emotional component to this experience of transcendence, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked about awe and this feeling of elevation, what other emotions might be a result of self-transcendence? I'm kind of jumping the gun here a little bit, but Kamamuta, yeah. I would consider. Yeah, and I, um, so Kamamuta, um, as you know, <laughs> is, um, it, uh, ref it's a Sanskrit term for being moved by love. And this work is coming out largely from a group of scholars in Norway um, and I love their work. Uh, I, I think it's great. Um, I had a, a grad student from there come and study with me for a semester here. And um, so, but the illicit, and I, and there's an excellent, there's an excellent um, paper called Moving Through the Literature, Moving Through the Literature. And it's talking about the different ways that people use that term moving. Mm -hmm. So with Kamamuta, I think, you know, many of the measures that they use, we would use too in elevation. The main difference, I think, is that their focus is very specific, like moved by love. Mm -hmm. um, seeing what they'll say is um, a... a, a, a uh, a sudden display of communal sharing. Mm -hmm. So that might be you're at the airport and you see these two people who haven't seen one another for a long time, you know, reunite. So, um, I, and I, I think it's a, a marvelous strand of research. It, the, the only difference for me is that I think we can experience um, awe, for example, that doesn't necessarily have to be about communal sharing. So I I, I, I am broader than that, mm -hmm. but messier than that because, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're very specific. Okay, so this might be a distinctive subcomponent, this kamamuta of other elevational processes that takes take place during, for example, self-transcendent media. Um, exposure it i think it's an example of self-transcendence i don't know if they would agree with me on that but i do i think it is yeah. okay ah that's yeah. very interesting so that also leads us directly to the model um okay. so I, I would start with going through it our starting point is exposure i mean that's pretty self-explanatory it means that a certain person is exposed to inspiring media content or chooses to consume the inspiring media content. And there are certain influences on people choosing inspiring media content like personality variables or what you've called feedback loops in the model. And we'll come back to that in a bit. But first, let's look at the next step. So a person is exposed to inspiring media. And now it's important what properties this inspiring media content has. In your model, that is called the message component. Now, as a question for you, what kind of properties of inspiring media content are there that may or may not have an influence on our response to the media content? So there have been um, uh, several content analyses um, of YouTube videos, um, memes, uh, Diana Rieger, and, and uh, her colleagues, um, uh, uh, Sophie, Yannicka Bowles, um, and Katie Dale. And, um, and so there are certain things that seem to be common. Um, uh, uh, appreciation of beauty and excellence um, is one. Kindness, which is really in keeping with the idea of Kamamuta. Um, compassion, hope. These are pretty common elicitors. So that's more the the content side, right? 
Mm -hmm. And are there also some um, influences on the formal side? So for example, which medium we choose to broadcast the message? So for example, music or movies or uh, series? Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, m most of the work has examined, I would say arguably most of the work has examined visual media. Mm -hmm. um, so film, video, although, you know, uh, as some has, some research has looked at just stories in the news, you know, um, and, and how that works. But your question is good because one thing that, you know, people have studied music per se, but I've noticed in my own work when we use videos that, the music that is in accompanying the visual is, I think is really hugely important. And uh, we've manipulated that in some research um, on this topic, but I think that that's a, an area that's ripe for research. Um, I, I'll tell you one thing that's caught my attention lately, because I got my at my request, my husband gave me um, a virtual reality headset for Christmas. <laughs> that's a great present. Yeah, it is. It's a little dangerous. You can waste a lot of time, but you can. But there are some amazing things out there that I think really deserve our attention. And now it's time for us to move forward to the next component. So yeah. do your responses component, but I mean, you, you would think that's the right way to go, right? Certain media messages can elicit certain responses that corresponds to path C in the model. But we also have path E influencing path C. That means that certain personality variables moderate the influence a certain media message has. So what kinds of personality traits are there that have an influence on, one, on what responses a person shows when encountering inspiring media? So, the, so in that model, there are a lot of them that we have studied and a lot of them that we you know, haven't looked at all that much, but we think could be consequential. But so there, <clears throat> there are variable, there are, are, are dispositional traits um, like empathy, um, universality, um, uh, um, high, high levels of moral identity, um, spirituality, you know, so these sorts of traits, there's even a, a, a trait measure of the tendency to be engaged by moral beauty. Um, so those variables, um, people who score high on those tend to also have a greater response. Okay, though, so these strengthen, strengthen the response. But might there be certain personality variables that also, um, yeah, make the response go the other way around? So feeling the message as corny or manipulative, for example. So I had, yeah, I had the pleasure of working with Marcus Appel and Mike Slater on, on this question. And, um, we specifically looked at um, elements of the dark triad, narcissism, psychopathy, Machiavellianism. Yeah. <laughs> and so what, what we found there was that um, people who scored high on those traits tended to find the uh, meaningful uh, scenes um, from, from film as as much more corny, sappy, mm -hmm. um, whereas they didn't find non-meaningful content less, they didn't evaluate that lower, yeah. you know? So it was something about those traits and the, the idea that people should be moved, you know, this is meaningful media. And so it's like, no, I'm not <laughs> moved yeah. by that. And do you, do you have a hypothesis why this is happening to them? 
Well, you know what? I don't I mean, I think that that in many respects, the be scoring high on the on that implies scoring low on empathy, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so a lot of those kind of meaningful things, meaningful um, stimuli, almost require a level of empathy, per, you know, perspective taking how that would feel. And I think these elements of the dark triad uh, imply the, a, a tendency not mm-hmm. to engage in that. Yeah. yeah. So we have these responses feeling manipulated or or yeah taking the content as corny and we we also had these self-transcendence emotions like all oh, otherness inspiration um what other responses do inspiring media messages elicit other than self-transcendence or disgust i'm very curious about moral out like the whole idea of moral outrage yeah. and as an as an example just an anecdote Uh, several years back, Pepsi um, <laughs> put released this advertisement where they were kind of rifting on Black Lives Matter movement and Kendall Jenner. They she was modeling, but she saw all these cool people doing a, a, a social protest, and she joined in. And she saved the day by walking up to a cop and giving him a a Pepsi. <laughs> And that was so, I mean, if you, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, um, this ad. And if you look through the comment section of it, people were absolutely outraged by that. And Pepsi pulled the ad after one day. I can't like, imagine. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in, I, and I, I don't know if disgust and anger and moral outrage go together because disgust like a lot of people would say that is disgusting i am outraged um but i find it interesting because an, when jo- jonathan Haidt first was talking about elevation he placed it on a continuum where elevation was on one end of that continuum and disgust was on the other mm-hmm. and i don't think a lot of people have studied this other com- end so I'm very interested in it. And I think that it can happen and does is, but I haven't studied it formally yet. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. Do you think that this emotional response of disgust is only a negative response in terms of pro-social outcomes when, when we talk about inspiring media or can this also channel the, the anger for good social causes yeah you know that see that's really a great question and it introduces a methodological issue too okay so as uh, you know as as an example um again with uh, black lives matter um when i watch those videos of black lives matter protests i'm inspired by the people who went out to protest, but I'm outraged about why they had to do that, right? And the thing is, is like, so I'm feeling both, but, you know, inspiration and outrage, but the elicitors are different, right? So, um, so, how to measure that is a good question. Like, um, because we can say, I am, I am outraged. It depends on what you're asking. Are you asking me how I feel? Are you asking me to evaluate that message? Are you asking me to evaluate why that message occurred? So I, yes. So this is a long-winded answer to your question. I think that outrage can, and inspiration can inspire outcomes that are positive, but I think it can also inspire outcomes that are not positive. (laughs) Yeah, and and can they, when the inspiring 
counteracts or the disgust counteracts the inspiring part of the the inspiring response can they also produce a kind of null effect well i mean uh, i i don't know if the black lives matter is just a rarefied example but i think that there are some messages that can ju that just elicit flat out disgust like the pepsi ad some that elicit f feelings of inspiration, elevation, and there's no, uh, you know, out yeah. disgust or outrage at all. And then some that may do both. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that's getting at your question, but it, these, like, in my opinion, these are understudied areas, but I think that they're re really important because of the implications in terms of political involvement um you know yeah. engagement with social issues yeah sure I, i i mean we will come back to that in a bit 